Okay, our next science highlight is by Xiaoxing Pi on imaging the ionosphere using space-borne synthetic aperture radar. Uh, I'd like to mention uh, my colleagues, uh, Bruce Chapman and Tony Freeman at JPL. They have helped me uh, greatly in understanding and process SAR data. And Dr. Shimada uh, from uh, JAXA, he was the PI of uh, ALOS, Japanese uh, ALOS um, mission that I will mention that he was very, he, he's very friendly and nice and provide some data specifically for this study to us and then also discuss with a, 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 var a variety of uh, inside applications including ionospheric imaging too. Um, Franz Meyer used to be at the Alaska Satellite Facility. Now he's, uh, he's a faculty member at the University of Alaska. We're collaborating to doing uh, related research. Uh, I was actually um, brought into, or well, I got into this study, uh, this work, uh, mostly because of uh, Earth science missions. And a few of them are mentioned here, such as this uh, Curis, uh, which was launched in June last year. It, it, it was to measure the global sea surface salinity. Uh, another one is called SMAP. It's a soil moisture active and passive mission uh, that uh, was scheduled launched in 2014, but it got delayed and it will be launched in 2015. There was, uh, there is a, a NASA Earth Science flagship INSAR mission that has been planned for quite a while, for quite a few years. It, it was originally scheduled launch in 2016, but it got delayed, delayed, delayed. Now uh, it's uh, going back to under study because of uh, our budget constraint. Um, these ALOS satellites, uh, Advanced Land Observing Satellites, um, it's a JAXA's mission. It's a Japanese mission launched in, in January 2006. Uh, the mission completed five years later. Uh, it's a great uh, success, successful mission that I will get a little bit deeper in, in it uh, because I'm gonna show some data. Um, the, uh, the satellite mission carries three uh, instruments. Uh, one of them is, uh, is so-called phase array type L-band SAR, a synthetic aperture radar. It flies at 690, about 690 kilometer altitude. It's sun synchronous orbit uh, at 10 a.m., 10 p.m. That's an interesting uh, in the local time selection, uh, which we will talk about a little bit later. And the repeat uh, period, the, the satellite repeat, repeat uh, visit in the same spot at about 46 days. Uh, this is sort of a little bit longer than what they really want, and they have a follow-on mission. It's, uh, uh, the, the revisiting period is much shorter. And the pulsar instrument, it's an L-band SAR, and it's a synthetic aperture radar, and it has frequency bandwidth, a chirp bandwidth at 20, 28 megahertz for for a single polarization mode and a 14 megahertz for a multiple uh, po uh, polarization mode. I will discuss a little bit later. Um, uh, actually, I can talk about it now because uh, these, they have this uh, quad pole operation mode, uh, which basically they transmit signals in both horizontal and vertical polarization directions by receiving the signal also in the horizontal and the vertical directions. So you combine these different orientations, you can get four components. Basically, you quadruple your uh, amount of data to be collected. So that's a huge amount of data uh, compared with a single polarization, but because it's operated at a little bit the narrow um, frequency band, so the data amount, it's not exactly quadruple, but it's, uh, it's still a huge amount of data they're trying to handle, they, so they cannot operate continuously. So to make it uh, experimental mode, to collect data in some place at some time. And the radar operates primarily in three uh, type of modes. One is a fine beam mode, and the other one is polarization mode. Uh, it's sort of more traditional, so you got a very high resolution in terms of range, direction, or it's a cross-track direction. It's less than 10 meters in general. In the um, along-track directions, the resolution is much better. 
but for this scan mode, uh, you have a much larger uh, swaths on the ground, and you can get about a 250 to 350 kilometer swaths, but uh, you sacrifice resolution a little bit. Um, because it's an L band, the signal is affected by the ionosphere, as we know. Uh, one of the effect, uh, particularly for this polarization mode they're operating, is the so-called far, far rotation effect. Uh, basically, uh, if you have signal, uh, radio uh, or electromagnetic wave propagates through a magnetized um, plasma media or ionosphere in our case, if you have linearized um, uh, polarization, for example, and you know, as the signal propagates into the media, its signal will split into ordinary, actual ordinary waves, so it propagates in different speeds and uh, rotates in different directions, becomes circularized uh, polarization. As it comes out, this angle referred to the original polarization will change, will change. So that change of the angle is called far rotation angle. It's proportional to the integration of the electron density along the line of sight, uh, but it's also affected by the angle between your wave propagation and ambient magnetic field. So approximately, because in the SAR image, uh, the radio geometry doesn't change a whole lot, and then the magnetic field doesn't change a lot too. For each radio link or each radio pixel that you can approximately um, take these parameters out of the uh, equation using the medium value to represent uh, the, uh, the entire integration, then, then you can get the direct relation with TEC. If you measure the far rotation, you can also get the TEC. Now, how do we derive TEC from, the, uh, from these, uh, these measurements, the radar measurements? Um, just briefly, and the scattered power, signal power from these four different channels, uh, you know, transmitting horizontally, vertically, receiving horizontally, from these four channels, this is what you're supposed to get uh, from the scattering of the signal. But the system really measure is this matrix, which involves a lot of uh, uh, system system uh, uh, distortions, such as these so-called crosstalk distortion and also channel imbalance in both uh, receiving and the transmitting matrix. And they're also affected by far rotation if at the L band. Uh, uh, I should mention the uh, far rotation is affected by uh, its related to the signal. It's inversely uh, proportional to the square of the radio frequency. Uh, at, I, at a frequency like C band, X band, the effect is much, much smaller. Uh, at L band, the signal, uh, the effect becomes appreciable at the lower frequencies, and this effect is more significant. So, but you have to deal with all these system first to remove all these system distortions, so your matrix becomes only left over is the far rotation and the scattered, um, um, scattered signal in both transmitting and a receiving path. Now, if you remove all the system parameters or you, distortions, you do, we call it the polarization calibration, and you can apply some algorithms, and this is one of them. Uh, there are three algorithms people have been practiced. So this one turns out to be a more effective one. Simply, you just do a, uh, I think it's a circular polarization transformation, you can derive the far rotation in this way. Now I'm gonna show you some examples of the ALOS pulsar data um, collected during uh, the mission, mission period throughout, from 2006 uh, throughout, to, I think it's 2010 or 2011. But these four um, images shown the horizontal transmission, horizontal receiving image for an area in Alaska. 
and this is horizontal transmits the vertical receiving, this vertical transmits the horizontal receiving, this vertical transmits the vertical receiving. Now, this image don't show it very clearly, but if you look at through your computer screen, you can see more details, nicely such as these um, topographic features like high altitude mountain areas, this is lower areas like a valley, but there's uh, detailed structures and you can see very high resolution images. Um, you combine these, these four images throughout the, uh, using the algorithm that I mentioned before, then you can derive this file rotation image. And that sh uh, this one shows some curvatures in the image and shows this very bright arc uh, in the center. And it's tilted too. Uh, because it's, this is a relative new technique, and we're wondering um, whether this is real or something else, and then uh, we try to va validate it through uh, using different measurements. And, but before I show you some, some other measurements, I like to show and this data collected 46 days, this is the same area as illuminated by the radar, and, and, but on a different day, exactly same place, but the conditions, the geographic, uh, geophysical conditions different on this day, there's geomagnetic storm going on, and these days it's relatively quiet. So you don't see a lot of structures with, within this image, although you're shining on the same spot. And, and now, I'm going to show you more images. This one uh, is, is a pass, it's, it's ALO's pass. Uh, uh, here I plotted 15 uh, image frames and put, process all these image frames together to add all these um, distance in, or well, uh, basically rotate it back and because, uh, because these lens of the uh, slides. So this is going north approximately north and this direction, and this is a cross-track direction. So the dimension of these is about 900 kilometers. Um, this is about 30 kilometers. So you can see these, these arcs, features, and sometimes you can see the very, very faint one too. So we were, um, were trying to figure out whether they are real, real or not. We try to reduce the noise to figure out. It's about 0.2 degree from the rotation that we can derive from these kind of images and with this radar. And, and this, this one is specific, this one is corresponding to about 12 TEC units. units. And those, those small structures here, it's actually real. And so you can, if they are, we believe they are related to uh, aurora arcs. And then so you can see the very bright and the sharp aurora feature, and then on the two edges, you can see the gradients of, of the brightness of, uh, well, in this case, it's a TEC or far rotation. Now, now we, uh, we examine some data like GPS data, TEC, and, and in this case, we're using the data collected from Alaska Fairbanks, and they, uh, these, uh, the one of the one of the satellite link, the, the receiver satellite link that we're seeing this, uh, this is the trajectory of the GPS satellites on the ground, latitude, longitude, and this is the SAR um, pass, satellite pass over this region, and this is the station. And this is the elevation angle, and this is a relative TEC, line of sight of TEC are plotted here. Then you can see a lot of irregularities or at least TEC disturbances in the, at, at the time and in the, in the, uh, the, the radar pass that we observed using the GPS receiver, then you also compute this rate of TEC index. You, you sort of know that there is a irregularity going on on there uh, on that day in the same case. We also plotted the rate of TEC index using uh, a subset of GPS network, GPS IGS network, and in the polar region, and projected the rate of TEC index in a two dimension on, on the geographic location coordinates. Then we can see the SA, uh, uh, radar is really passes through this irregularity region in the polar region. Now we mentioned those arcs that might be related to the uh, air glow arcs. Um, so we try to make sure that's true, and, and my, my collaborator um, 
Franz Mayer actually dig out uh, one of the uh, air, old sky imager uh, observing air glow and on, on, overla on, on top of this old sky image of air glow, so we, uh, he overlapped these SAR images, exactly same SAR images, same day, same time, on top of these, these aurora arcs. So this helps us to validate and these, uh, the new techniques really measure the ionospheric features and associated with aurora arcs. But you may also notice these radar resolution is much, is actually higher than your optical image. And in this dimension, and after reducing the noise, we can get about 150 meters resolution in this, in this uh, direction and about uh, half kilometer in this, in this dimension. So um, that case was uh, for high latitudes. So here it shows a case for the, low la uh, for the middle latitudes. And this is the pass, it's over through North America in uh, part of uh, North United States, get into Canada. And I, I don't think you can see it clearly, but this is Ottawa, this is Toronto. Here is uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont, you know, the, in this region. And this, on this, uh, did I put the dates there somewhere? Yeah, it's uh, May 23rd, 2007. So in this case, we see, uh, we see the large gradient of uh, far rotation, roughly estimated TEC on both ends. So, so in this region, there's a typical ionospheric trough that you can also see in these, uh, uh, these radar measurements. In other cases, we also analyze data over Japan. In Japan, during the summertime, this GPS TEC data show frequently during the summertime the medium scale TIDs occurring uh, in Japan. And this one is one of the cases corresponding to these exactly same time, same, uh, same day. And, and we analyze TEC data show the wave-like structures in the far rotation. We also compute the TEC show uh, the same features that, that basically tells, and also the magnitude of fluctuation magnitude is sort of uh, uh, consistent with the GPS measurements, uh, relative uh, uh, fluctuation magnitude. So, but this basically said this, this technique, you can measure uh, the gravity wave through, but the resolution here, because we have to reduce uh, the noise due to the ground, the topography features, so the resolution in this image is relatively poor, it's about, two kilometers. Now let's move to the low latitudes, and, and this specific case is uh, taken in the South America, and this is Brazil. Um, the, in this case, we see a lot of uh, irregular, irregular structures like scintillation-like signal in the far rotation. So we know the scintillation also, the irregularity can cause scintillation in the polarization, and then we average data that we can see these far rotation tends to re, uh, reduce um, from its, its nominal value. It looks like, it looks like there may be TEC depletion or plasma bubbles in this case that occurred. So we detect the scintillation and the plasma bubbles. And we also try to use the GPS data to try to identify whether that's real, but bottom line is, and the GPS data show us the irregularity activities at a different time in different location, but we were not able to identify exactly the same spot uh, through the GPS link in that image, but in general, the activities uh, that, at that night is very, very uh, active, the irregularities. Now, we're in the process of doing some survey of scintillation effects uh, on these uh, radar, these uh, ALOS radar, and this, these are about 2,800 uh, images in the South America region which identify about 14% of these images affected by ionospheric scintillation and those as, as during 74% of the days during that month, it's October 2010. And, and these images show these uh, very distinguished streaks in the SAR images we think they're due to the irregularities. I'm sorry, I'm around a little bit late. And this is my summary, summary slides. Basically tells this technique 
It's a, it's a very powerful, it's a relative new. It gives a high resolution measurements. Um, it's a, compared to the optical measurements, I'd like to say it's all weather, but, but it's still, it's a, there's still some atmospheric effects uh, on the, uh, the, the delay the, of the signal, radio signal. But the important thing is these kind of technique can be applied for a mission that serves dual purposes, earth science and space science. There's some limitations, uh, which I don't have time to give detail, I'll just leave it there. Thank you.